this presentation, we will discuss the surgical technique for a patient undergoing a laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy. The patient is a 42-year-old female who has struggled with obesity for most of her adult life. Her preoperative BMI was 37.8, and her comorbidities include hypertension and obstructive sleep apnea requiring CPAP. Her preoperative EGD revealed chronic gastritis with H. pylori, for which she completed treatment prior to her operation. After the patient has been positioned supine with arms out, and an orogastric tube is inserted after intubation, we begin the procedure by making a small stab incision in the left subcostal region and inserting a barous needle. After insufflating to 15 millimeters of mercury, we change this out for a 12 millimeter port that was placed using an optical trocar. After confirming no injury during barous needle or trocar insertion, we proceed with placing our remaining ports under direct visualization, including a 12 millimeter left periumbilical port for the laparoscope, a 5 millimeter right subcostal trocar, approximately two finger breasts below the liver edge, and a 15 millimeter port in the right hemiabdomen between the right subcostal port and the umbilicus. It is important not to place the 15 millimeter port to cephalad, as this will make articulation of the first staple fire difficult due to the proximity to the gastric antrum. We routinely perform a bilateral tap lock in four quadrants using diluted liposomal bupivacaine for our bariatric patients. This is injected into the plane between the internal oblique and transversalis muscular layers for regional postoperative pain control. The patient is then placed in reverse Trendelenburg. A Nathanson liver retractor is then inserted into the abdomen through a subxiphoid stab incision, which is attached to a table-mounted retractor. It is important not to wedge the liver bar directly in between the liver lobes, as this may cause liver tearing and bleeding. At this point, we also reduce the insufflation pressure to minimize postoperative pain and the physiologic effects related to pneumoperitoneum without compromising the working space or visualization needed to complete the procedure safely. In this case, we perform the remainder of the operation with an insufflation pressure of 8. We begin the dissection by starting along the inferior aspect of the stomach greater curvature around the junction between the body and the antrum of the stomach where the gastroepiploic tissue is relatively thin and easier to enter into the lesser sac space. A grasper is used to hold the stomach on tension near our plane of dissection, while the assistant retracts the greater curvature of fat and vessels. Using a bipolar sealing energy device, we dissect close along the edge of our stomach up towards the fundus dividing the gastroepiploic vessels. It is important to not divide far lateral from the gastric edge in order to preserve the gastroepiploic blood supply to both the omentum and the spleen. It also allows easier removal of the specimen at the end of the operation. As the spleen is approached, we double burn to ensure hemostasis of the short gastric vessels. The cut function is triggered after our second burn medially. There may also be posterior attachments that require additional dissection. However, care must be taken to avoid dissecting deep posteriorly and dividing branches of the left gastric artery, which supplies the gastric sleeve. Once the spleen has been reached, we turn our attention to the inferior greater curvature attachments, working towards the pylorus from where we had originally started our greater curvature dissection. These are taken down in a similar fashion. However, the dissection is performed from the assistant side of the table. Care is taken not to dissect too deeply in this plane, as you can go through the transverse colon mesentery and enter into the infracolic space where the small bowel is present. This can also create a potential internal hernia site. Our dissection is carried close to the pylorus as possible to ensure we will have enough of the distal stomach free from adhesions for our first staple fire. Now with the distal stomach mobilized, we can adequately retract the fundus anterior medially in a spiral motion while pulling into the trocar to gain appropriate exposure and tension for the remainder of the dissection. The superior splenic pole vessels are coagulated and divided during this step by first coagulating the posterior short gastric artery and working in a cephalid manner until the final superior splenic vessels are coagulated and divided without undue tension on these vessels, which may cause unexpected bleeding if accidentally torn. Next, we transition to dissecting the phrenoesophageal capsule and separating the angle of his fibers from the left crus. The inferior phrenic artery becomes visible during this part of the dissection. In some cases, there is a significant arterial branch that comes off the inferior phrenic artery and feeds directly into the GE junction. If possible, this branch to the GE junction is preserved in order to minimize the risk of ischemia 
to the gastroesophageal junction, where the majority of leaks during sleeve gastrectomy occur. The gastric stapling part of the sleeve procedure begins at the junction of where the gastric tissue transitions from disorganized to organized propulsion of ingested food, which is typically the junction between the antrum and the body of the stomach. This inflection point is usually visible on the greater curvature of the stomach at approximately 3 to 6 centimeters away from the pylorus. The organized part of the stomach, which includes the antrum and pyloric pump, is preserved in order for this portion of the stomach to quickly expel food from the stomach and into the duodenum thereby driving the bariatric effect of the sleeve procedure. We first ensure that the antrum is flat in preparation for our first staple fire. The left-handed grasper stabilizes the stomach in proper position at the junction of the antrum and the body of the stomach. For this case, we use a powered stapler device to perform our sleeve gastrectomy. Before alignment, we ensure that our orogastric tube is removed. We then position our stapler so that the staple fire is flat and even with the stomach. We also articulate the stapler to screen right in order to ensure the area at the incensura is not narrowed. We partially close the stapler in order to grasp the stomach. The left hand then adjusts the stomach at the level of the incensura to verify appropriate stapler positioning. The stapler is then fully closed and the device is fired. The first fire is important in determining the starting point of the sleeve gastrectomy to ensure all of the disorganized segment of the stomach will be included in our specimen. A 40 French bougie is then inserted into the stomach by the anesthesia team along the lesser curvature. This is guided into the stomach and positioned next to the pylorus. We then perform our second staple fire. Again, the left-hand grasper stabilizes the stomach by grasping the tail of the previous staple line. The stapler is inserted and articulated to hug the bougie so that the stomach slightly dimples when palpated by the assistant. The edge of the lesser curvature blood vessels also serves as a guide. The stapler is partially closed while the assistant gently retracts the greater curvature to ensure the posterior stomach is involved within the staple fire. This second fire is important in determining how tight the sleeve will be. As we continue the sleeve, we remove any migratory crotch stitches to prevent bunching and misfiring at the corner of each staple fire. Regarding the types of staple loads utilized to create the gastric sleeve, we typically use two black staple cartridges to start the sleeve. These staples are of a larger height to accommodate the thicker antrum. As we move along the body of the stomach to the fundus, the tissue becomes less thick. At this point, we complete the sleeve using purple staple cartridges, which are of a slightly smaller height. We typically use staple lines with reinforcement buttress material for all of our staple fires. All staple cartridges used for this case are 60 millimeters in length. The cartridge colors and staple type will vary depending on which institution you may be operating. At every fire, you want to ensure that the crotch of the stapler is meeting the crotch of the previous staple line. As you approach the GE junction, it is safe to aim the tip of the stapler towards the inferior phrenic artery. If too medial to this, you run the risk of potentially disrupting the GE junction and incorporating the esophageal wall within the staple fire. Being too lateral puts the patient at risk of leaving an excessive dog ear. This will place the patient at risk for a leak due to the relative ischemia at this area, and also due to the increased endoluminal pressure created from the sleeve anatomy. For the last staple fire, the goal is to ensure that the lateral and posterior stomach are retracted so that the stomach is not folded at the staple fire site. It is also necessary to visualize the stapler tips after closure to verify that there will be no tissue attachment at the end of the fire. Improper staple fire again puts the patient at risk for a leak. Once completely transected, the staple line is inspected 
and cut using laparoscopic shears to separate the stomach specimen from the gastric sleeve. At this point, the endoscope is passed into the gastric sleeve and guided to the pylorus. The scope is then slowly withdrawn, inspecting the staple line for integrity and hemostasis. As this is being retracted, the assistant gently irrigates over the stomach while insufflated to confirm a negative leak test. From the endoscope view, the staple line should not twist or should appear as if you could drop a coin straight down a well. At completion of the endoscopy, the scope is again passed down to the antrum and insufflation is evacuated. The liver retractor is then carefully removed. Using an uncut free stitch suture, we take a decent bite of the end of the gastric specimen and remove the needle through the trocar. The stomach is then pulled into the trocar and the trocar is removed. The fascia is then stretched using a clamp in order to accommodate removal of the specimen. The initial skin incision may need to be extended to allow for a proper removal. The stomach is then removed by alternating retraction on the staple line side and the greater curvature side to avoid the specimen from becoming stuck within the incision site and tearing. We routinely close our specimen retraction site due to the stretching of the fascia. In this case, we use the commercially available fascial closure device to complete our closure. After the conclusion of this procedure, the patient was admitted for a single night hospital stay. She was placed on a stage two bariatric diet and was discharged the following day.